you for inviting me here. Uh, I'm actually glad that it's a rainy day because we get more people in. <laughs> But first of all, I will, um, I will present some things, some aspects of my work that I've been doing so far because uh, the organizer asked me so and uh, I'm glad I did because now I'm seeing some of the answers from the uh, film interview. Okay, we as apologists are working outside um, um, academia do have an impact and uh, it is valuable. So. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of my background. I did my PhD at the uh, University of Kent where I met Maria, and also uh, it was a co joint uh, joint uh, program with Marlborough University. I was studying environmental uh, impact and uh, in the Delta Delta, and I also made after after I finished my PhD, I made a film, um, like Lights Among Daughters. Um, and then I moved on with storytelling. I, uh, I've been collaborating for, with uh, National Geographic. So I took my expertise in how we, how we as apologists see uh, culture, see the problems of the culture, and put it for the larger audience. Uh, this was before uh, Antopedia was available. And uh, I started back then to feel, what can I do that my research wouldn't end up in um, Academic, uh, academic, like digital, digital shell, uh, getting more, nothing more than dust over the over the uh, over the years. So that's why I shifted towards storytelling. And for the for the first for the first uh, uh, issue here, I collaborated with a local photographer, Lemo Sibla, and for the other two, uh, I, col I collaborated also with the anthropologist which made a lot of sense. Uh, he, his name is Adina Kuzu. Um, another thing that I'm doing besides, uh, because the National Geographic is there now in Romania, at least, um, I'm, I am being a consultant for the World Bank, and I've been doing an apology research for development programs. I've also been involved in storytelling for them and community engagement. You can see here I've been working in different, on different projects in the Daniel Delta, trying to put the management plans and also community engagement. My main focus as an anthropologist is not social inclusion and it is definitely not Roma communities. There are other, um, other uh, very well established uh, researchers in this field, like, uh, like Lina, who just presented here. Uh, but I am um, Yes, so my, as I said, my main, main background is in environmental anthropology. Still, right now, I'm doing um, a consultancy for protecting areas management plans, meaning that I go in national parks, like you see here in Boila National Park, or Kayla Nelly National Park, and I'm representing locals' point of view. So therefore, uh, the for future management plans uh, for these national parks would not include just the, the expertise of the conservationists or ecologists or biologists, but also the, uh, the point of view of the local people living here because they are very much part of the system, although for the past decades in Romania it does not seem so. Um, so, and what else I'm doing, I'm actually, this is my main uh, job. I'm an assistant professor and faculty of theater and film. And I'm teaching students a documentary filmmaking master program. So this is not a program focused on social or anthropology, but on documentary filmmaking. And within this program, I am um, I am teaching one class. Uh, it's called Introduction to Anthropology to filmmaking students. So I'm teaching students the main concepts of anthropology, ethnicity, language, worldview, subjectivity, subjectivity, reflexivity a lot of it because they need it. The main theory is the rest research methods and they are doing a bit of research, field research for themselves without the cameras because we believe that in order to make a um, not relevant but uh, conscious uh, and awareness, having the awareness, you as a, a filmmaker, you need to have 
some basics of the anthropology. So this is one class that I'm teaching there, and the second class is, a, is called social documentary, but it actually turned into an international and interdisciplinary class. We have, what does it mean? We have a collaboration of two perspectives, cultures and language and time zones. We have, uh, so we have an online class with film students from Babesh Boyoy. They are also, they are also students uh, from audiovisual staff students from uh, Universa, Universa Cattolica in Italy and uh, anthropology students from University of Wyoming, USA. So we have this class, we had this class for three years now and uh, after a semester uh, working together online, these students have to make a short video with three perspectives, uh, three perspectives from these uh, three backgrounds they are coming from. And some of the some of the results we had so far, there are some short documentaries that were, have been awarded at uh, international film festivals, like Morning Routine or One Click Away. So Morning Routine is a film about the Ukrainian uh, the, the war in Ukraine and has been made from uh, uh, Romanian, Italian, and uh, and American perspective. And One Click Away is a, is a film about death and it, it encompasses. Uh, uh, opinions and perspectives on that from Romania, Italy, and, uh, and the US. So uh, this is how we try to combine uh, the split perspective in, in one film. Uh, okay, and uh, now we started a new collaboration with the University of Southern California. This is not a film school, it is an engineering school. And what are we actually doing? We've already been there. The Utebi School of Engineering at the University of Southern California, they have this program. It is called Global Challenges Innovation. And what do they actually do? It's an incubator to find solutions. It's either products or services. So the students have to come up with a product or a service to global problems, uh, such as refugees or poverty. Uh, the students are made from engineering, IT, business, architecture, and storytelling. And in this um, and in this scheme, we joined we as a, the University of Babish Boy joined with our students. So our film film students will try to collab will co collaborate with the students and with uh, engineering students and will try to make visual visual uh, products uh, or storytelling uh, products on the, on their uh, on their projects. Uh, we went to Ukraine here like a month ago. And well, what does what's the role that anthropology is playing in this is creating empathy, reflexivity, cultural awareness, method and approach. As in, I am teaching both Romanian and uh, University of Southern California um, students these workshops on approaches, reflexivity, cultural differences, and how to make uh, different products or services on these big uh, on these big problems such as war poverty and so on, from uh, with empathy, with reflexivity and being aware of the cultural differences. So this is an ongoing project we started like a month ago and we're excited to see where it goes. Okay, so now I'm actually going to get into the core of the problem, why I'm here especially. So I just want to make sure that uh, I have this brief introduction on the on the the, um, on the things you can do with anthropology, because uh, we had this uh, first uh, first interview today, and because we have so many students who, especially in this context, are asking, what are you going to do with anthropology? What is the use of anthropology now? And I've been asked this uh, in starting with 2000 something when I was a student, and they were asking me. Uh, if my mother lets me <laughs> go for anthropology school, is she aware that I'm not going to get a job, I'm not going to be jobless? But my mother supported me, and I'm really happy that she did. And uh, context in the meantime, especially now, in 2020-2023, has changed, and uh, a lot of um, companies or other projects are involving anthropologists. So the context has changed for the past two decades, I would say for the better. Um, so anyway, 
And now I'm going to present briefly the project that I'm here for, that I worked on this project, involvement of Roma uh, communities in cloud risk management. Uh, it is an applied anthropology case, and it has been a pilot project and a premiere in the practices of many administrative apparatus. Like, for instance, you may ask, uh, said that we anthropologists, uh, a lot of times, we are mistaken or taken for the, for the liaison between the Roma community and uh, the institutions. And with this, with this project, we really, start, we really try to make the, um, the, local, the local and the regional authorities to directly collaborate with the local communities, not through our, not through our uh, words or our, uh, our connection, but sitting in front of them at the same table. But uh, I'm going to give you more details about this very soon. So as I said, uh, authorities that directly collaborated with the vulnerable Roma communities to find solutions together. Uh, and this is a workflow project. It is, uh, I mean, the name of it because it was a big, uh, it was a huge project in Romania. It is called strengthening the capacity of the central public authority in the water field in order to implement the second and the third stage of the second cycle of the first directive. Uh, and it involved Ministry of Environment, Water and Forest as a project leader and Romanian Waters National Administration partner. It was a partner with the support of the World Bank. Uh, so the duration of this project, of the Roma project, was between January 2022 to September 23. And the World Bank team was Cosmin uh, Fyodorov, was he was the project manager. He, we had Diana Pizzao, a senior specialist coming from Washington, D.C. It was me on social inclusion, Katalin Bevescu on social inclusion, and we had uh, Ioana Dorescu, an environmental and stakeholder engagement specialist. So this was a multidisciplinary uh, team. And uh, why did we do this? Because uh, the national, the Romanian waters identified as necessary, the, uh, as necessary to strengthen the, ca the capacity to involve marginalized and poor communities in flood risk management. Uh, basically, they said, okay, because this was a project for the in a flood, uh, uh, managing of the flood risk for the entire Romania, no matter what the ethnicity or so on. But within this huge project, they, they considered that they don't have enough tools or knowledge on how to handle the poor and the marginalized communities. And that's why we started this uh, pilot. Um, and why Roma communities? Because they are highly vulnerable. They have been disadvantaged ethnic for centuries. They've been marginalized. As you can see in this um, picture, there's a high rate of poverty. There are a lot of children and elders. And uh, if they are being struck by, uh, by, uh, by a flood or another natural, natural uh, phenomenon, this is a disaster for them because they reflect the resources to recover. And why again? Because uh, and why are they settled on the side of the river, like in this picture here? Because they for, uh, for the 500 years they have been enslaved and after the freedom of slavery, they would still be marginalized. So they were occupying that, occupying, they, were, they were settling in these uh, very bad neighborhoods because there were, have been always uh, prone to flooding because these have not been wanted by the majority of the population and they were only left with what was ever out there which was the worst places, which are the flooded places. Uh, so the main objective of this um, project was to develop a practical guide for authorities for involving Roma communities in the flood risk management and we wanted to have a guide that would eventually be able to be applied in other, in other fields. Um, okay, regarding the approach of methods, uh, it was an inter interdisciplinary approach. We had structured the dialogue and participation, emphasis on participation, at the intersection between public administration, hydrology, disaster risk, and urban planning. So in this uh, interdisciplinary approach, Anthropological play 
uh, you want to know because we did field research, we had ethnographic profile of the local communities. Uh, we are more interested in local ecological knowledge on flood risk and local practices for first response. And those were the basis for future discussion with the all stakeholders. So we, uh, me, especially as an anthropologist, we were looking at, first of all, the local knowledge, how and practices, what do we do uh, when there's a flood coming in, so the future uh, risk flood uh, management should be based on this, not coming from the office or something that does not have with, uh, doesn't have too much in common with the reality in the field. Um, as in uh, anthropological methods, I used field observations, semi structural interviews, and mapping the stakeholders. We had, uh, in order to get the guide done, we did uh, the pilot in three communities in Rocha uh, Montana, in Bogulesh, and in Pogliasca, in three places. And how we selected, what are the criteria to select these uh, three communities? First of all, they, the communities had to have a significant share of the Roma population. Uh, the communities were, were supposed to be located in areas with high flood risk, and all of them are. Um, we wanted to have a selection of cases representative of their geographical and cultural context. We do know when we talk about Roma, it's actually an umbrella term, and within the Roma, what we call Roma communities, actually there's a lot of uh, geographical, cultural um, uh, variety. So we wanted to have three uh, different commu communities. And we were looking at especially how they are being led. We wanted a community that has no leaders. We wanted to a community who has um, powerful leaders and one with multiple leaders because this was uh, in the framework of our, of our uh, research. So first of all, I'm just going to give you a very brief ethnographic uh, description. You can see here how close the, the uh, settlement is being built, right on the way, right almost on the river. There are 700 people. They have two or four active leaders. They have a Roma local council. We identified the vice mayor, non Roma, who was very involved. And they, the risk here is of the flash flood and landslide, and it's very urgent. Uh, anytime this could happen again, like it happened uh, uh, the disastrous one two years ago, and the next one is striking any minute. Uh, the second one in Bangladesh, it's a bigger community, it's 3,000 people. Here, unlike the other community, uh, the mayor and the entire local council is a Roma. Uh, they are collaborating with the structures uh, of the emergency response. The risk of flood here is because if you can see here one of the rivers, but it's, it's in a dry season. So uh, it is at the settlement is at the confluence of two major rivers. And although they have they are well represented in local council, at the Regional, regional or central administration level, they think they are being ignored and excluded. And we have Pogliasca, which is a very poor community. 400 people, they have no formal leader. Formal <coughs> when I asked them, who is, uh, who is your boss, who is your leader here, they said, uh, we only have one boss and that is God. So they are at the, uh, absolutely have no formal or informal leader. They are a Dali, they only speak Romanian language. We also found a vice mayor who is really involved with your problems. And again, the risk uh, is here is of the flash flood. You can see here how people started to uh, to build up on the on the hill not to be flooded again. But you can see here where the black dog is could easily turn into a river in a matter of uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so we have we developed this process in three stages. The first stage is the community visit. First of all, we wanted to, to know what kind of community it is and who are the local leaders in order to be represented. And we were asking about local knowledge and flood risk and practices for first response. We would ask themselves, what well, if the flood is coming, what do you do? 
most of the most of the answer were like we put some salami and a, and a bread in a plastic bag and we run up on the hill. So we were looking at this kind of uh, and how do they inform each other? How do you know the flood is coming? Who are you gonna look for uh, when the flood is coming? Who gonna say it first? So we were looking how they are organized within their own community in order to be able to not necessarily to replicate, but to base our future, uh, future authorities plan based on this. Um, okay, so then we, uh, with the first, on the first stage, we looked at uh, identifying the representatives of local and regional authorities who will be involved in the process. Because um, we talk about process and we're a community and how we can get engaged, but it's actually talking about people. We need to know who is actually going to be there, who is actually going to answer the call and say, yeah, I'm going to come at the meeting. So these are really important things. We just, uh, after we met the community and we, made, or we learned about the basic, the, the main problems we are going to the, first, the second stage was a round table. We got the representatives of local communities, their leaders, and uh, representatives of, of local and regional authorities and institutions. So you can see here in the, in the lower picture, it's a picture from uh, Rosha Montana. On one side, we will have the Roma leaders. On the other side, we will have the uh, Romanian waters uh, and uh, prefecture uh, and uh, East school uh, representatives, and of course, of course, the mayor. So they were discussing, discuss, dis, discussing and debating on the solutions um, on how they can do it together. Uh, they, we were trying to get them to develop a flood prevention and response act, uh, action plan together. Uh, there was a lot of tensions in some of these meetings, but uh, in, final, uh, in the final discussions we had some agreement. So it is important to understand that this is not like a walk in the park. And uh, like, uh, like Irina said before me, there's a lot of tension, there's a lot of trust, more lack of trust. So people actually don't know why should we do this anymore, nothing is going to uh, happen anyway. But if, uh, and I do understand because you are there with your house almost being flushed by a flood and nobody is, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how I would act if, if out of them. But so I do understand the high level of frustration, but at the same time, uh, we believe that this is a process that needs to be done through collaboration and discussion. Uh, and after the second stage, we drafted the guide, the guide that I'm going to present uh, with general, general conclusions. Then, for the third stage and the last stage, we had a roundtable for revising the guide together. So we went back in the communities and in the local communities and they said, so this is what you said last time, based on this we came with, uh, you and the others came with these solutions. Uh, do you agree with them? And most of them agree with them. So we wanted the, the guide to be confirmed and approved by everybody at the table. And then we went uh, with, uh, with uh, on another field visit together with, with authorities, so they would see on the side what's going on. Um, and we wanted to validate the guide with all the stakeholders involved, and we did. And after that, we disseminated the results and training with Romanian Waters and Environment uh, Ministry representatives on the use of the guide. So we had a training session with the representatives from all over Romania to, to teach them, to teach them, to train them how to use the guide. And um, here is the guide, I'm not going to go through all this. I just want to say that this is out there. We can all, uh, any, any of you can use it. So what you see here, there are 13 steps. So we started with the first step, from the first step to the third to the thirteenth step, and it's each step it includes objectives, inputs, outputs, tools, and the list that each step might have. So uh, if you take it and you and you are involved in a process like this, we believe that this guide can be of great help. It shows you exactly what you should be looking at and what is actually working and how
how you could use it for, for the benefit of your projects. Um, as I said, this is, a, and we put it in a, almost a technical, uh, technical table like this, to be easily understood by every, anyone else who is not an anthropologist. Okay? We wanted to emphasize that. Uh, so the key messages of this process is that for solid cooperation, it is necessary the authorities to know the ethnographic profile of the community and approach them with respect and consideration. Tension and mutual mistrust can be uh, can be smooth but with um, constant dialogue. It is a long process and needs constant patience and involvement. So um, don't think that you, if you want to go over there, people will be you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm so glad you're here, let's start working together. No, there's a lot of mistrust, why you're here, we don't believe you, uh, how much money you to make, how much money you're going to make with projects on our name and on, in our behalf, and we're actually not going to see any uh, difference for the, our community. So these things are actually going on. But what is important that is you need patience and involvement, and you Actually, it will happen. Um, community focused participatory approach like this one might become more, and more in the future uh, EU programs, and this guide can serve as a model for other fields. So, we believe that this is kind of the direction that EU is shifting towards a uh, community based approach, a participatory approach, not top down but uh, bottom up in order to be, to be sustainable and to be viable in large term. The main conclusion is that anthropological approach in these type of projects, the grassroots, based on discussion and possible solutions for, uh, uh, for proper community involvement. And if you have this kind of involvement and in this kind of approach, grassroots, the select solutions are accepted and appropriated instead of being ignored and contested. Uh, why I'm saying this is because there are a lot of projects that are being done top down, as I said. Uh, Romania is no exception, but uh, so it's not, it's not only us that we're doing this, Romanians, but it is increasingly, increasingly uh, common to, to get people involved directly. So this guide shows you how to involve directly the people in the process. And as I said, the 13-step step guide provides details on tools, approach, resources. And why do we do this? So the process will not require participation of social experts. Because we are thinking, okay, we're making this guide, this guide for instance, for Romanian water, so for, um, for the environmental, environmental Ministry of Romania. And they do not have in their, uh, in their, like their employees they are not no, there's no social expert, there's no anthropologist and so on. So what are you going to do? You're not going to get the people involved, there are more people involved if they don't have this. No, let's have a guide that could be easily understood and used by people in these, uh, in these institutions who do not have proper academic or uh, anthropological background, social background. So uh, if you are here among you, people who are interested in uh, community involvement and other people and, uh, in this type of approach, and you do not have um, do not have a proper uh, anthropological background, uh, do not fear. This is why we have this is exactly why we have this guide for you, for people who are involved in education, health, uh, social inclusion to work on these projects using this type of guides. Um, and the guide can be found at inundazi.org, resources and others.